And we're live. Uh, we're live here today with uh, Walt Dickinson from one of two parts of uh, the brothers behind Wicked Weed Brewing in Asheville. Uh, no stranger, I'm no stranger to Wicked Weed beers, and anybody who listens there reads the website knows how much I love uh, the beers. Um, today's going to be kind of like a, a little bit of a two-part uh, conversation. So um, we are going to kind of get into the into the weeds, no pun intended, with Wicked Weed. Um, kind of see where they've come since we spoke with Luke about a year and a half ago, I think. I think now. Um, and then we're going to really kind of focus on um, fruit refermentation and um, from a from a brewer's perspective, a brewery that does fruit refermentation really, really well. It's going to be part of an article we're doing on the website, um, and it's going to be embedded in that article. So, um, how's it going, Walt? It's going good, man. Going good. Psyched to be here. Sweet. So, I was just up at the brewery. We were talking about it a little bit. Got the chance to uh, see the Funkatorium and try a lot of the beers that are that you guys have there. But it looks like you guys are taking over Asheville. I mean, what kind of setup you guys have going these days? Well, I don't, I don't know if it's kind of, I don't know if you can take over Asheville when you have Sierra Nevada, New Belgium, Oscar Blues, Highlands, <laughs> Green Man, all these other guys. But, you know, we're, we're trying to at least leave our, our little wicked stamp on Asheville, which is, um, you know, really focused on uh, kind of a, a unique pub experience, the, the Funkatorium, which is our barrel house and that kind of food and, and uh, sour and, and farmhouse beer experience. And then, uh, and then obviously we we were we built the big brewery and, and that's producing uh, our IPA and some other beers in package and now we're working on our fourth facility which is basically an expansion of the sour program which we're calling the Funk House and that's a uh, I guess the yeah, best way to describe it would be a kind of production formatted uh, sour house so really really structured for um, us producing larger volumes of these beers and, and kind of having the space to to produce more barrel aged beer right now we're we're pretty uh maxed out at the Funktorium with uh, 1,400 barrels and a few fooders. So new spatial is about seven times the size of what we're working in now. So it's going to really allow us to have a little bit more room to, to move and also do some some new fun stuff. I've got a lot more custom equipment coming in. It's going to allow us to kind of take what we're doing and specifically talking about fruit refermentation, um, really building our sellers to work with the fruit, which is a big piece of what we're doing here. Yeah, I love, I love kind of the setup you guys have. And you know, the pub has its own feel to it, and there's a tap room also. The Funkatorium has its own feel to it. Um, we talked at length with Luke about uh, branding and, and the imagery, and but it's it's really cool, and I, I'm a big believer in the experience around the product, and you guys do a really great job of creating, you know, an atmosphere and experience the product. Um, I, I'm assuming there's a, and, and probably a lot of people who know a little bit about sour beer and, uh, Clean beer differences. Uh, there's a reason why the Fungatorium is not part of the pub. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think for most basic reasons, uh, you know, there's nothing that says you can't produce uh, sour beer and uh, what we like to call clean beer, so Saccharomyces beer in the same facility. Uh, but it was a decision Luke and I made early on uh, that they would be separate facilities and that a piece of our brand would be that we were kind of these these two breweries within one. You know, it was going to be the Funkatorium, which was a focused sour house uh, and, and working with mixed culture fermentation and farmhouse beers. And then the pub or the clean side, which was really focused on that West Coast style, you know, like bringing the big IPAs, uh, definitely see some of that kind of dogfish uh, creative influence that Luke and I have from the background there, uh, especially with Eric Leipold being on as our head of, sour, or our head of brewing operations. Um, and, you know, the goal was to create a two totally different uh, retail and consumer experiences that really let people kind of understand the nu nuance and the difference of what we're doing. But also, you know, we're, we're trying to produce a lot of beer and produce it well. And I think it's a, it's a large risk to bring uh, mixed culture fermentation and bacteria into a brewery producing like really dry West Coast style beers and lagers and, and everything else we're doing. So for us, it was a, a safety call along with, um, you know, just kind of a brand decision that we wanted to make so we could really kind of let people see what we were doing and kind of showcase, I think, a lot of the differences that Luke and I have in how we approach brewing and what we're doing. Yeah, and you guys even at the, I mean, you can drink some of the, some of the sours at the actual brew pub, but um, <clears throat> most, I guess, most of the, of the top floor is uh, going to be bottled sour beer, right? I mean, you guys aren't running, you guys are separating lines completely, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, we have, we, have, we have dedicated sour lines. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, from a sanitary 
uh, perspective as far as making sure the beer stays consistent online. We have a certain amount of draft lines that are dedicated to sour beer downstairs. Uh, and then upstairs at the pub, we've got uh, basically a keg box that we'll run two kegs on, uh, one to two kegs on at a time. And that's kind of how we handle sour beer at the pub. And then all the production, obviously, which is where, you know, we're, we're not too worried about pouring beer through the taps. Um, you know, it's kegs on dedicated lines. Uh, it's really the production side. If we were to be doing, uh, you know, uh, Brett farmhouse beer in the same tank. I was trying to make a Keller pills in the next week. Uh, not to say you couldn't do it. Uh, many breweries do and they do it successfully. But for us, uh, we were lucky enough to have the infrastructure to, to separate the two. And, and honestly, the volume needs kind of dictated that two spaces was going to work better than one. So is there something about, say, I always wonder this because Miami, you know, you think Miami's a big city. There's so much money, here, like a lot of really big potential funding here for, for breweries to open up. And we're so far behind. It seems like uh, the city's not helpful. The state's not helpful. Is there something about Asheville that allowed you guys to have four spaces? And then if you walk around, you go from block to block to block, and there's breweries on every corner. I mean, it's a pretty amazing thing. Um, is there – I don't know if you know, but is there anything about Asheville yeah. that encouraged that kind of thing? or is it, Well, I think so. I think, um, you know, what Asheville is is Asheville is a – it is a mountain town that's an escape and kind of an oasis from a lot of the heat and a lot of the experiences in the Southeast. I and mean, we have a lot of really large uh, metropolitans around us. And then, uh, you know, I think this is just a community of, of beer drinking folk. I mean, you know, it's, it's artists and outdoor enthusiasts and, you know, restaurateurs and, and um, service industry folks who, who really appreciate, appreciate experience and appreciate beverage. So I think that we just created a beer community. And I think you have to give a shout out to Oscar Wong and Highlands. You know, the first brewery started here back in the mid nineties and, you know, them being kind of one of the first breweries to really kind of step up to the plate in North Carolina, being one of the oldest breweries in North Carolina, you know, having craft as a component of what this community experiences, I think that really led to building uh, a culture of beer and with a culture of beer and a culture of tourism, uh, the two have kind of married really well and allowed us the ability to have a lot of breweries. Um, you know, cause at the end of the day, we're a small town in comparison to, to somewhere like Miami, 90,000 people. Uh, yet we probably see 250,000 people on the weekends and I'd say 125 of them are getting pretty drunk. So, um, <laughs> it allows us all to, to be successful and have an opportunity to like showcase our differences. And I don't know, it just, it's a community thing. And I think Miami will come. I think every city will come along. I know there's some good things happening down there. Uh, and, you know, this is just part of the craft beer movement. And, you know, I'd say we're one of the most progressive cities in the Southeast as far as craft beer goes, but that's trickling down. And I mean, you look, even if you look at where Asheville was five years ago, 10 years ago compared to, or shit, you know, like three years ago before we opened compared to how it is now, um, you know, the, the, the market's changing really quickly. And I think craft beer is going to show its face really strongly in, in any community. I'm sure Miami is just, it's just, you know, it's just going to take a minute. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of cities like that too. I just use Miami because that's where I'm at. But uh, yeah, it, it was pretty. It was pretty awesome to see that. It felt like you know there's, there had to be some sort of catalyst there. Maybe government stayed out of the picture and said we actually want this kind of tourism. We want this industry. Oh, and they do, and they do support it absolutely. And you know the the EDC has been uh, Economic Development Committee, uh, and the county and the city have been really. Uh, you know, they worked really hard to make sure the brewing industry thrived. You know, they they helped us uh, as we expanded into our new facility. And they've done the same thing for a lot of other breweries because they recognize that's that's what we're building our foundation as a city on. And, and it's a, you know, beer tourism is a big thing here. I mean, we we, can, we we will see three quarter million visitors a year at the pub. Um, you know, Sierra Nevada and those guys are, are probably doing similar numbers. I mean, it's a lot of people coming here to just see what beer is all about. And uh, that's, that's a lot of dollars into the community. So, you know, luckily we have a, a city and a county that supports that. Yeah. So uh, the other thing, and I guess we're going to start kind of sort of transitioning into the fruit refermentation aspect and what you do at the Funkatorium. But, you know, being up in that area is so beautiful. It's so, there's so much uh, nature and wildlife. Got some time, spent some time over at Fauna Floor with Todd. Yep. Another guy who's really inspired by the area. I know you guys are as well. I mean, how, how inspired are you by the surrounding area and how does that influence what you guys do, if at all, at the Funkatorium? Well, yeah. So, um, you know, I am part like this is home. I grew up here. Um, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big climber when I'm not, when I'm not working, I'm trying to get out in the woods as much as I can. I think mean, that's one of the beauties of Asheville is that we have, you know, a, uh, it's a city in the middle of national forest. So it's only about a 20 minute drive in any direction. You can be out in the national forest or, or a state park or something. So 
I think that plays a role in um, just kind of influencing uh, the kind of beers I wanted to make. I think being in an agricultural community makes me more excited to make farmhouse style beers. It also gives me a lot of uh, access to ingredients. I mean, literally just a couple hours ago, I was at a, at a farm down in uh, Hendersonville uh, looking, looking at their, their blackberries for a uh, blackberry sour I want to be doing soon. So I, you know, I committed to buying about 4,000 pounds of blackberries from them. Um, and, uh, same thing, you know, we, we grow apples and all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, uh, you know, the, the farming community here is fairly strong. So you know, I think that plays a role in influencing, um, the beers we produce. I mean, it's really important to me that we're working with as many, uh, as many local farmers and as many local ingredients as possible. Another great example of that would be, you know, Riverbend malt, all Asheville grown, or Appalachian grown, Asheville malted, uh, six row Pilsner, and most of sour beers, and a lot of wheat and rye also. So, I mean, that, that experience is, uh, I think it does, it does shape what we're doing. Um, I would say that, you know, Todd, Todd is a, is a special case where he is, he is, yeah. He is so connected. It's it's like beyond. Uh, it's like extreme localism, which you know he he really is like he's almost representing like the farm to table brewery. Yeah. Actually, um, he and I just did a beer uh, a collaboration. That's I think uh, the ninth of this month. It'll be released at his place. We're doing like a shared tap takeover, releasing it. It's a a beer called Funk and Flora, and uh, you know basically I went up to his place. We mashed in. Uh, walked away from the mash tun. Went out in the woods and like picked wild wild strawberries. Uh, wild ginger, uh, uh, some uh, honeysuckle and elderflower. No, not elderflower. Honeysuckle and um, uh, locust flower and yarrow, and came back and uh, made a beer and then aged it in white wine barrels with our mixed <laughs> culture. And ended up being a really beautiful beer. So I mean, those are you know those things you can do on a three barrel scale. Uh, you know, my yeah. batch size is about sixty barrels, so you know, <laughs> oh, thousand gallons. So it's a little yeah. harder now for me to go do that kind of stuff on on our scale. Yeah. But I do find the best ingredients are the ones cl like closest to home, and so. Anytime we can, we're working with those. And I think that being in such an agriculturally driven and food driven community, it really is, it's, it's definitely shaped the way we look at producing beers and uh, helps us kind of find new paths that maybe we wouldn't have found. It's funny you mentioned the size difference. That always comes kind of like a recurring theme in these interviews. Yeah. Um, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, everyone's kind of sad to, to, they're happy that people want their beer that much yeah. <laughs> through these 60 barrel batches, but then they kind of like, I really miss going out and like throwing in whatever roots I find. And, uh -huh. <laughs> like, and I, I hope to still be able to do both of those things. I think, you know, we, we, we're lucky that, you know, we have a little three barrel system we can play around on. we got a 50 barrel system. we got a 15 at the pub. I'm building a custom 30 barrel for the new sour program. Um, so we got a lot of different toys to play on and, uh, I never feel I never feel constrained creatively. Sometimes I just have to, you know, it honestly just pushes you to be a little bit better at what you do by having to take some idea and and kind of scale it up a little bit more. And and realistically, the larger batch size is just making better beer. So we're we're happy with the the size we're at for the sour program. Awesome. So I think I think right now, I mean, I've, I've been drinking it while we've been talking. I uh, I want to, I guess bring it up. I'm drinking Marina, mm -hmm. which is uh, it's fermented with peaches and apricots. Yep. It's a really beautiful looking beer. It's it's. We were talking about it a little bit beforehand. It's well. First of all, I didn't tell you, but when I opened the bottle up, like the, the aroma of the the fruit just hit me in the face. It was pretty awesome. And then it's a really soft, but and and well balanced and subtle beer. So I, I'm seeing a lot of uh, even even some of your guys' stuff. The fruit is very forward. I mean, and so this one's a little bit. I feel like a little bit more restrained. It's a little more balanced. Is and so, I guess before we get into maybe some of the decisions as to why that is, um, maybe some of the story behind the concept of Marina. Um, yeah, so, so Marina is kind of a fun beer as far as a concept. Um, there is a beer we produce called Medora, and Medora is a blackberry raspberry sour. And it's, uh, you know, we'll talk about um, this whole thing is about fruit refermentation and how we use fruit. And I use fruit in a lot of different ways, and that beer. Uh, we're, we're adding the fruit going into oak, which is something we do. We also do a lot of post-fruiting in, in our beers. And depending on the kind of character from the fruit I want to get, I'm using different techniques. So that one is this beautiful, just like blackberry, raspberry, jammy, brett forward, oak forward sour beer. It's probably one of the most popular sour beers we produce. Um, it's about a pound per gallon. So that's looking at, again, you know, 1,000 gallons of beer. I'm using 1,000 gallons of fruit. Um, Marina, the idea of Marina is, you know, I wanted to kind of take that same idea of Medora and like, what would her sister look like if she was just like kind of the polar opposite, you know, and, and to me that would be the stone fruit. So it's, it's peaches and those are South Carolina grown peaches. 
Um, same peaches we just used in uh, Garcon de Firm, which is our peach farmhouse. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I love the way that. And that was like two pounds per gallon of peaches. So that was a lot of peaches in that thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, so uh, the idea was that and apricots, you know, and I think that was a beautiful marriage. And both of those beers, like the fruit is to be part of the beer, but very much a balanced component of the overall flavor. Um, will I adjust that over time? Yeah, probably. I always tweak everything. But uh, where that beer is right now, you know, those are, are more so – um, just kind of playing up the nuances of the acidity, the nuances of the Britannomyces character and the grain and the barrel, and, and just trying to create this really balanced experience. Whereas, you know, other beers we produce, uh, you know, a good example would be any of the Angels or like Cerise Mort that I just put out. You know, those are pushing four, five, six pounds per gallon and are really just these like massive fruit forward mm -hmm. beers that are, are really just expressing uh, fruit character in a really nuanced way, which I think sour beer is uniquely able to do. Sure. And so pound... Pound per gallon. A lot of people talk about pounds per barrel, per barrel and, yeah. and, and, and you're like hitting pounds per gallon of what people put in their barrels. Um, it's pretty. It's pretty amazing. How much are you losing of of, of work of beer? I guess at the end of the day, because of this fruit, is it a, is a huge margin? Is it something that people should be accounting for as they brew beer with fruit? Yeah, so with our sour program, um, I think we're really known for producing fruit-forward sour beers. It's kind of I, – I love the marriage of, um, of fruit and working with organic you know, solids and beer. I think it just adds to complexity and allows us to take beer in, like, really cool places that it hasn't gone before. So, you know, in that, I think that we're probably somewhere – depending on the beer, we're anywhere from about 15 to 40 percent uh, loss. Uh, on the beer 40s on the high side that was golden wow. angel this year which was like six pounds per gallon of apricots so that was a little obscene um but most of the beers like when i'm going in those like heavily fruited beers i'm looking at about a 30 35 percent loss on the total beer uh and uh light lightly like the one pound per gallon probably more than like the 15 to 20. Okay. so there's a lot of loss incurred but at the same time like you know if you want to produce a beer with that much fruit flavor you really gotta kind of gotta hang it out there man yeah, that's one of the that's one of the things you know. A lot of people, and we'll get back into the technique behind Marina. I, I kind of want to get into your how you approach Marina uh, from a fruiting perspective. Mm -hmm. But you know, as I as I talk to a lot of people <clears throat> about uh, sour beer in particular and fruited sour beer in particular, people go, "Oh, how can that one bottle be twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen dollars? How can people charge?" And and that's one of the reasons right there. I mean, it, these beers are time consuming. They're expensive to produce. There's a lot of loss involved. The fruits in themselves are expensive. Um, so no real question there. It's just kind of a point to make on your point. Yeah, um, no, totally. I mean, I, I think that's one of those things with the the sour beer um, market right now is that, and, and you know, people are going to take advantage of of the kind of perceived price point of stuff. But yeah, I mean, some of these beers I'm spending upwards of like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars of fruit not counting my oak costs plus barrel storage for over a year, blending labor, packaging, right. which the package is not inexpensive. So, I mean, you know, I'm not saying there's no margin in these beers. There is. We wouldn't be producing if there weren't. Um, but mainly, like, we love making these beers, and we're just going to make them to the best of our ability. And I think the one of the beautiful parts of what I've been blessed with in my role at Wicked Weed is that I have the rest of my ownership. Uh, they never question, you know, if I want to go spend $50,000 on an ingredient for a beer – uh, they just accept that that's part of the brewing process and we're going to go do it and we're going to execute it to the best of our ability and, and make something, you know, that the consumer hopefully enjoys and wants to purchase. And then it keeps, keeps kind of, you know, keeps working out. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, what turned me on, I mean, it's, 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 it's proving to, to work and it, what turned me on to you guys a long time ago was Genesis, I think. Oh, cool, man. That um, my new, my new blend of that is uh, actually about to come out in like two weeks. I haven't, I haven't mm -hmm. released it in like a year and, Pretty happy. I, I did some tweaks on the, uh, you know, standard. The, the kind of joke in the brewery is like, uh, what would Walt do? He would just add more fruit. So I, I, <laughs> I increased. That's like Wicked Weed's secret ingredients. More. That's the <laughs> secret ingredient. Wicked Weed. So um, we'll, uh, yeah. It's it's got a little more fruit character than it used to have, oh, wow, cool. which I really appreciate. It's kind of more of a tropical fruit bomb, which I'm psyched about. Yeah, it's it's a gorgeous beer. I can't. I mean, hopefully, I get my hands on one of those, but I can't. I can't wait to try it. But. Um, Marina, let's get back to Marina. Um, I guess, can you walk us through the process? I mean, you know, typical brew day, I assume, and then uh, I guess fermentation, fermentation forward. How are we achieving a beer like that? Like Marina. 
Yeah. yeah. So, so this beer, um, and I, I kind of mentioned earlier when we're talking about fruit additions and how we're working with fruit, you basically have in our program, we, we use fruit in two different places. One, uh, just before it goes into Oak, so it can age on the fruit or the other would be coming out of Oak, blending it onto fruit and doing a fruit refermentation. So, uh, this beer is a, yeah, fairly typical brew day, um, very protein heavy grist through that. Um, then we'll knock it out into open horizontal fermenters. There we're doing primary Britannomyces fermentation with our mixed culture of Brett. That is our house culture. Um, there's no lacto, PDO, no bacteria in that. It is, it is a yeast only uh, blend that we're doing what's primary it? fermentation with. Yeah, what, what, what's, the, what's the reason behind that? Um, because I, I believe strongly that we are a Brett brewery. Uh, and Britannomyces to me is the backbone of great sour beer. And, and without Brett, all of the beauty that we think of as sour beer wouldn't really exist because that's the thing that makes it all happen. That's, that's the organism that is kind of the masterful, you know, the, the conductor almost that's making sure all the flavors come into harmony and working through all the, all the off flavors and then re-metabolizing those. So, uh, and also is producing some of those beautiful flavor compounds in these beers. So for me, like having a healthy Brett culture is really important to what we do. Yeah. Um, so we try to make sure that we let it really develop through primary fermentation without the pH dropping too much. Uh, and so our concept is basically produce a nice Brett base beer. And then after that, we'll sour it. So basically we take that, we bring it over at that point, we'll blend in a portion of our mother beer, uh, which is a golden sour called cassette. Um, and so we'll blend a portion of that beer in to inoculate the beer. We'll add fruit. There'll be a refermentate and for, for Marina specifically, we, we add, you know, 2,000 pounds of peaches and apricots that we pureed um, from, you, you basically take whole fruit, break it down, puree it into the tank, all of that referments. And then once that's kind of just gone through that just initial like fermentation from the yeast having access to all those simple sugars in the fruit, once that's kind of calmed down, we basically rouse and pump that full slurry of beer, yeast, fruit, everything into the barrels. And then at that point we let it age uh, until, you know, I taste it and things ready to blend. So pretty it's easy, slurry. pretty straightforward brewing. It's one of those, it'll tell me when it's ready kind of things. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, our, our bacteria and our house culture is fairly predictable. I know this yeah. beer in the barrel somewhere in the like 9 to 11, 12 months is going to be ready to probably blend. So we kind of track based on a predicted time frame of aging. Um, and then, you know, then there's some other stuff we just kind of let go and see where it's at, especially one-off stuff. I'm kind of just, those are less of a timetable, more so just tasting those along the way and see where I like them. Cool. I noticed that also you have like a, one or two barrels, uh, you call them like they're the acetic barrels. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody yeah, and, has their own theory on that. Does that co come into play in your mind when you're coming up with a blend? Uh, oh, we can go pull a little bit of that at a little mm -hmm. complexity. Yeah, we don't really keep a specific like acetic barrel around. Uh, we played around with that idea of keeping a barrel that had turned acetic uh, and kind of re-pitching re in that barrel to, to make sure I had some acetic beer to blend if I needed to kind of just just bump acetic character a little bit. Um, we really fight to keep – I mean, I think if you drink our beer, you'll, you'll notice like acetic acid is fairly like not there ever, which is kind of our goal. Um, but that said, I think it plays a very important role in very small levels below threshold. So – um, I'm more so looking for beers that are developing a little bit of acetic acid within the brewery that I can blend off. Uh, but you know, overall we kind of keep that out. And, and I do think that to be a great blender, you need to understand the nuance of off flavors, um, in, you know, off flavors like ethyl acetate, nail polish, or acetic acid, you know, those being kind of just below threshold levels where you can't really perceive them on the palate they're playing uh, a role in developing complexity of acidity and mouthfeel and fruit character that I think plays a really important role. And that's one of those tough things that like, I mean, I can say that in this interview, but until you've like tasted and blended and like, I mean, you know, I'm three and a half years into blending now full time and I still, I'm, I'm, I'm just starting to figure all this out and really learn it and really understand how to use those tools properly. So it is one of those things where I am looking for variants in my barrels for blending but at the end of the day, I'll take a nice, consistent, Brett forward, you know, lactic barrel all day. And that's, that's really what we shoot to produce. Sure. Let's take a, step, a little step back now. Still talking about fruit, but uh, does, it, does the idea by, behind what fruit you're going to use come before recipe creation? Or you think, you know, like, I guess the thought process, first of all, you know, um, 
how, how do how, what goes through your head first of all when you're thinking about this is gonna be an next fruited beer? Is it is it the recipe? Is it the fruits I want to use? I'm gonna match the recipe to it. The recipe I want to use, I'm gonna match the fruit to it. I know you guys are really artistic. Is it a? Uh, I think Luke was saying you guys don't even when you guys are tasting through beer, you don't even talk about necessarily what you're tasting. You're talking about like emotions it evokes and mm -hmm. scenery it evokes. Um, so for you guys. Is fruit selection based? What is it based on? Is it based on something like something more abstract like that, or is it based on? Well, I really want to brew this style of beer, and I think this fruit would go well with it, or vice versa. I think it's a little bit of all those things. Um, okay. You know, depending on the beers we do. I mean, some beers I'm producing base beers that I'm just blending and then refermenting on fruit. So sometimes I'm letting the beer kind of tell me what fruit it wants. You know, uh, a lot of times uh, the the fruit's driving me. You know, I'm. I'm coming up with like a fruit I want to work with and trying to build a beer that I think will support that fruit character and aging and, and, uh, and fruit refermentation. And then other times, you know, I'm, I'm looking at a, a dessert I had or a cocktail or, or something like that. And like, that's kind of driving my, my want to create a flavor profile. So I, I, you know, we're, I think we'll do, you know, in package, we'll do 70 plus brands this year as a company. So, I mean, we're pretty ADD as it, when it comes to brewing. And so like, I don't, I don't know if there's any one, I want to do all of those paths. You know, I want them all to drive us in different ways. And I think that that's something that we've kind of opened ourselves up to and just accepted. That's just part of uh, how, th how this whole thing goes. Uh, that was my national sales manager right there. Evan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways. Um, yeah, man. So, you know, I, I think for the most part, it's usually the ingredients are driving the recipe. You know, like if I'm going to make a beer with, uh, you know, like there's a guava sour in the barrel right now, you know, I, I chose to work with guava and then I build a recipe that I thought would work well with guava in the barrel. Cause I'm, I'm aging with the guava in the barrel. Now, if it's a beer, I'm going to re-ferment after, um, sometimes that's, um, preconceived that I want to produce a beer that I will re-ferment on fruit when it's done and I want a beer that'll match that. And sometimes I'm producing just some base sours that I'll blend uh, and then kind of choose a fruit based on what I'm tasting or whatever idea I have. So it, we kind of use it in a lot of different ways. Okay, so it's, again, okay, perfect answer is a mix of all three. So yeah. we've selected what fruit we want to use. Uh -huh. um, now sourcing fruit, I mean, is there any recommendation fresh versus frozen? Uh, pros and cons of each. Um, I know you guys, I know Asheville is like, we are local. Uh, local, local, local. Does that drive you using local fruit or is it, uh, you know, so I guess actual fruit, actually selecting the actual fruit that's going to go into fermentation. Um, some considerations and maybe some of the things you've learned along the way with, you know, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I made a mistake selecting. Totally. Yeah. 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 I think, uh, again, the answer to all of these things is always going to be like much more complex and like a yes or no. And that every fruit's different, you know, every fruit wants something different. Every fruit holds up differently. And I think those are the things you learn when you're working in, in this kind of environment where you're working with fruit so much and barrel aging is that, um, different fruit is going to benefit from being used in the fermentation process, different ways. It's also going to benefit from being selected, harvested, stored, whatever. So we're working with a mix of, Almost always we're working with whole fruit. Um, I like to see the fruit. Um, and by whole fruit, I don't necessarily mean that, um, I don't necessarily mean that I'm buying like, you know, a pallet of pineapples from the grocery store. Um, what I mean is I'm using whole chunks of fruit that I'm able to see and inspect before we process them. And then we puree everything in house. So we have like an industrial food processor that will run everything through to puree it. Um, and then again, depending, you know, some, some fruit I, I find actually holds up better if I get it in puree form. I mean, some tropical fruits, I think I get better tropical fruit character out of some of the purees I get. They tend to be more package stable and more flavor stable yeah. than if I were to buy IQF or whole fruit. Uh, berries, on the other hand, I always want those IQF uh, flash frozen from the farm that when they come here, they're like that perfect ripeness. Uh, we thaw them, break them down and go. Uh, whereas like, you know, peaches, I want you know, peaches are one of those things that are, are kind of better to get fresh in season. Now, anytime I can work with a local farmer and get, you know, straight from the farm to my doorstep, I'm always working with like fresh pick, perfectly ripe fruit. But one of the problems is if I tried to like say I want to work with kiwis, okay? Well, they don't grow kiwis in North Carolina, so I got to right. get them from somewhere in California or whatever. Well, if I get them from a farmer in California and I don't have them, uh, if they're not frozen, right? If they're not IQF, which means individually quick frozen, 
they're going to send me a bunch of underripe kiwis that are hopefully going to possibly ripen at some point from when they leave their place and when I decide to right. do whatever the hell I want to do with them. So what you end up with is 25% ripe kiwi and then you know the rest of it's all like green kiwis or overripe kiwis. Right. So it ends up you don't really have as good a, a product at the end of the day. So again, it really it's just depends on the for you to document you know, for, for purposes of recreation of that beer too, because you don't really, uh, you know, you don't really have a good understanding of where, you, you know, what percentage of what fruit is where it's at. Yep. Right. Is that totally. No, absolutely, man. And, and, you know, for us, it's like, we're looking, you know, how do we always make our beer better? Well, for us, a big piece of it is, you know, on these fruit beers, it's sourcing better fruit. So we're constantly trying to find better fruit purveyors, find, find better sources for these, these fruits, find better, um, you know, uh, formats for the fruit. So I think all that kind of plays a role in us developing like what our process looks like. I know that I think in Genesis you guys use papaya, and that threw yeah. me for a loop because I didn't see that as a. But now you're saying you, you puree most of your stuff. I mean, is that is it something is something like papaya easy to work with? Is it? it, it yeah, papaya is great, man. It's such a big meaty fruit. Um, I think uh, the original Genesis. Now we get it in IQF and process it all in house. But uh, the original Genesis, those were like papaya purees I was getting uh, early on in the program. We were mostly working with purees. We really converted to processing our own fruit as as we've grown. Again, it's just you know I want the beer to be better every time, and so the only way I think we get there is by pushing ourselves to find better ingredients and, and further kind of like dial in our our brewing process. You know. Sure. So I, I kind of want to work our way through. I'm kind of leading through a progression. But uh, one other question I have with fr actual fruit selection um, that you hear a lot about um, if you read books on brewing, fermentation, forums, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's I guess it's a two-part question. One is um, leaving skins on certain fruits versus mm -hmm. taking skins off. And then, and then with like the stone fruit, the fruit with a pit, you know, leaving the pit or using the whole fruit. Mm -hmm. taking the pit out and so i guess first uh, skins versus skin on versus skin off pit versus the first question yeah. second one would be the pit any so, opinion on that and any yeah so i mean again it's gonna be it's gonna be the same like answer it depends on the fruit right but what kind of i guess what kind of things can we expect if we're taking a peach it keeps coming up and we're leaving the skin on versus the skin off is there typical um maybe flavor profiles that we'll get from skin on fruits mm -hmm. versus well technically you know skins are typically going to give you more tannin right they're going to give you uh more bitterness um and i think that can be a really pleasant thing especially when you're talking with a thin skin fruit uh like a uh, peach um you know if you start talking about a mango or something like that obviously that's a very thick tough skin you're probably going to want to remove that um and then you know again i think the gray area is like what do you do with something like a kiwi which we talked about earlier, you know, a kiwi, that skin has this amazing uh, malic acid, bright popping kind of tartness to it. That can be really beautiful in a beer, but it's also the, the vision of what you want. Whereas the meat of a kiwi is very sweet and juicy, right? Less tart. So, you know, I think those are just decisions you have to make through experimentation as a brewer, whether like skins make sense or, or pits make sense. You know, obviously there's the tradition of the cherry pit and the creek and, and that kind of almond character you get out of that or the noyo uh, and the apricot, you know, it's obviously... Uh, Cascade kind of made that very popular. Um, and, uh, you know, those are really cool things. I uh, am not as big a glutton for punishment as Cascade, so I choose to never probably use a Noyo that I've selected, I've, I've hand removed from the pit, um, which, which again, for, for the people, the Noyo is like, it's like this little almond looking thing in the middle of an apricot pit. So basically you got to crack an apricot, split it open, and then crack the crack the nut open, and then the meat inside the nut. That's what they're putting for for a beer like uh, for for the noyo, and uh, it's really cool. I mean, it tastes like amaretto. You know, it tastes like almonds. It's pretty incredible. Um, but I also, uh, you know, I'm I'm I like it's always a balance for me of of like how much punishment do I want to put my guys through? To them do how much how much can I put them through before they just like mutiny and like you know start dumping barrels and take over the brew house and so we're. <laughs> We're hoping, you know, with with uh, you know, making sure we, we keep them well fed and well well boozed. Yeah. You, gotta, you gotta make it like a, if you're late five times in a month, you've gotta do that. <laughs> exactly right. 
<laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think it, again with the the fruits and pits, I think they each play roles that you have to make decisions on. Do we use uh, skins and pits? Not very often. I mean, again, peaches. I'm not too worried. We make decisions based on that. But as far as pits go, yeah, we never really use the pits. I do do a beer um, called uh, Montmoretto, which is a take on a uh, cherry uh, like whiskey, like Am Amaro sour. Mm -hmm. And um, we're we're actually to get the Amaretto character um, that I. It's also loosely inspired by a creek, right? Because with the cherry pit, you can you can pick up some of that kind of almondy nutmeg amaretto ish character. Uh, we actually age it with with almonds. Um, so if you're allergic to almonds, don't get that beer. <laughs> yeah, like my brother. <laughs> oh jeez, that's his yeah. like double negative a sour beer with almonds. It's like <laughs> so it's a, it's again it's really going to be a, a choice thing. But uh, skins you're going to get a little bit of tannin, a little a little bit of. Is, I mean, is there any any fruits you'd recommend never using the skin that you had experience with uh, no i mean i think that skins um you know i, I think this the ones that i'd be worried about i've never used the skins on because I, I find them to be like offensive again mango would be a great one uh, i mean that's just a very leathery bitter pithy gross thing uh but i'd say most most fruits i, I wouldn't be scared to go skin on i mean i'm very much about uh, especially if we're with like good organic fruits which we, we try to do the same um you know some of that microflora on the outside of the fruit skin is uh I don't know. I think it adds character and uniqueness to whatever you're producing. So it's kind of fun having that as part of the mix sometimes. But I think if you want to be more controlled and consistent in the fruit character and what you're executing, uh, if you're just working with the meat, it's going to be it's going to be more predictable, you know. Sure. And so what you just said kind of led me to the next step, right? So we've picked our fruit out. We've got the uh, we've got them in the in, in the brewery or in the in the processing center. Mm -hmm. And, and and we're getting ready to put them into a beer. Uh, you talked about some of the microflora on some of the skins. Are, are I mean, are, are, you, are you guys at Wicked Weed worried about, I guess not, some of the microflora <laughs> on the skins? Um, uh, is there any consideration given to the fact that there may be something on there that could contribute flavor to the beer? Is that something maybe you blend out? Or is that something you take care of prior to? By so, yeah, as far as like the, yeah, we don't, we don't, I don't really care about working with aseptics. I don't want pasteurized fruit. I think it hurts the fruit character. So for us, um, it's not something I really worry about. Our, um, our bugs, uh, our culture is strong. And it's, it's, uh, it would take a whole lot of uh, wild yeast to really have much of an impact flavor-wise on what we're executing and how aggressively we're inoculating the industry and just how like robust that culture is. Um, as far as like long-term impact and blending, um, you know, it's, it's not something we've really noticed. We, we try to be consistent with the fruits we're working with and, and we tend to get fairly consistent with the results. So it, it means that, you know, maybe, micro, maybe, maybe microflora is playing a role. Maybe some wild yeast are playing a role in a brand, Sure. but I like the brand. And so I'm going to do it again with the same fruit and I'm hopefully going to like it again. So far we've been pretty repeatable with those results. As far as post fruiting, I don't really worry about it then because the pH is too low and there's not really much left for the ferment, you know? So, um, that means the the resident culture tends to dominate at that point too. Okay, so okay, so I don't worry about it. All right, so processing fruit then. Um, obviously, there's going to be difference if it's coming to you as a puree versus if you're pureeing it yourself, taking the pits out yourself. Are you processing it right before you're throwing it into the beer, or yeah. is it, okay? Yeah. So what we're doing is we're taking. Um, and again, most of the time I'm looking for semi-processed fruit. I mean, I don't really want us to have to take time to like de-pit every peach and, you know, remove the skins off every pineapple. Like I'm looking for pineapple chunk. If I'm working with pineapple, I'm looking for whatever, you know, with berries, cherries, things like that. It's a little easier to get them straight. You know, obviously a de-pitter with cherries is, is great because like de-pitting cherries would be a nightmare. Again, this is all scale. I mean, some of the beers we're using are, you know, at a minimum we're using like 2,000 pounds of fruit going up to like six, seven, eight thousand pounds of fruit in a right. batch of beer. So processing. <laughs> yeah, the volume and effort it would take if we didn't have something that we could literally just like look at, inspect, and then puree. Um, but basically we just have a big hopper on our puree uh, on the on the food processor. And so, you know, it, it takes three guys to fruit a beer, depending on the beer, it takes, you know, four to four to six hours usually to process all the fruit. And basically we're just processing it, going straight into a fifty five gallon stainless steel drum and then pumping it up into the beer. Uh, to to mix into the beer and let it referment. Okay, so that's all right. So that's the next thing is how are we infusing this fruit into our beer? So, so the, I guess we're racking off the yeast from the primary fermentation mm -hmm. and into barrels. So where does our fruit come into the mix into the barrels? 
two different positions or two different places in the brewing process. One is uh, after we get through primary fermentation, we go into our secondary fermentation with the fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be a beer like Marina or Medora or Black Angel. Some of these core sours that we're working with recurrent, um, those are all fruited going into the barrel because I want to have that uh, softer kind of jammier character to the fruit and really let the bugs have it for a long time. Um, and so those will get a secondary fermentation. So basically we're racking that brett beer in, we're adding the fruit, right? So you got an active Britannomyces fermentation, we're adding the fruit, and then we're blending in some sour stock to add our lactopedio and all the rest of the bugs that are, are part of our house culture. Uh, at that point, you know, all of that kind of wakes up. It goes to this very simple sugar refermentation with the fructose and all the simple, simple sugars in the fruit. Um, and then at that point, now we have this kind of, uh, you know, the fruit's still there, but it, we've, we've gotten through a lot of the fermentation. So I'm not going to end up, it, basically what it does is it allows us to kind of drop out some of the, the like kind of more uh, pithy fruit solids and dead yeast cells. Uh, but at the same time, having like a pretty aggressive slurry of like fruit and yeast and bacteria to like run into the barrels. So at that point, we rack all that in the barrel to age. The other way we use it is when, you know, I blend a beer basically the same process, but I'm just blending out of barrels onto fruit uh, in a stainless tank to do fruit refermentation. And so at that point, you know, we never really, we usually only do that with a lot of fruit. So like we're, we're probably racking, you know, maybe 20 to 30 percent. 40% of the total volume is fruit in the tank and then we'll rack beer on top of that. And then basically at that point, we're just waiting around for a week or so for fermentation to kick off for, for like kind of more of the, the dormant uh, bacteria and, and Britannomyces in the barrel to kind of like kick up fermentation and, and break down the rest of the, the sugars in the fruit. And uh, you know, that to me brings out a much brighter, fresh fruit uh, character. You know, I think, you know, beers like red angel, uh, all, all the Angel Series beers, those, those receive like a double fruit where it goes into the barrel and out. But if, if you had a chance to try, it's not only our first one in the series we released, but Cerise Mart, which is the cherry. I uh, did. Cherry sour. Was... Oh, you did try it. Okay, cool. Insane. Insane. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Super psyched on that beer. But that's a great example of, that's just all post-fruit sour. So just massive cherry flavor, super bright. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the most beautiful fruit character uh, that we get is in, in post fruiting, but I think using both tools play different roles in, in what we're trying to achieve here. So, cool. So when we're talking about, I mean, Brett, Brett's a wonderful thing. That's I love Brett because he can eat and eat and eat and eat. Um, you know, some of the concern I see sometimes is when to add fruit on a Brett beer, right? Because when is the right time to add it? When is primary fermentation with a Brett beer done? Is it, you know, I guess. What levels are we getting at in our fermentation numbers wise that we can generally say, all right, now's a good time to add fruit. We have enough uh, active yeast going, uh, fermentation is still kind of going. It's probably done, but there's enough to kind of ferment the sugars from this fruit. And you guys are also blending in, uh, uh, what's the beer called? The cassette. The, cassette, right. So you're also blending in cassette. So you're, Act, you get, you're getting fermentation active again, but is there? I guess is there any kind of rule of thumb for when a 100% Brett fermented beer is ready for fruit? Yeah, I think I think it's more so about like what you got to think more less about the Brett. The Brett will take care of it, you know. And like I said, you know, we're blending. I blend it, you know, Cerise Mort. That's a blend of eight month old barrels all the way to like 24 month old barrels, mm -hmm. and you know that beer has been sitting there mostly dormant for a minimum of like six months as far as having a real active fermentation or anything happening in the barrel or, or more, maybe two, maybe a year and a half yet, you know, we see pickup and refermentation on the fruit within a week or so. So those, those microbes are there and they're active and they're willing to make sugar and alcohol. So uh, that's not a problem. I think more so you just want to look at like, how do you want your fruit to taste? How do you want it to impact the beer? And I think depending on when you add it, you know, if fruits in early, uh, during full fermentation, depending on temperature control and stuff like that, you may see more like esters and phenols being produced that maybe don't positively reflect the way you want that fruit to be in the beer. Uh, but that said, Brett's going to probably turn those into something awesome long term, so you wait that out. I do find that if I want the brighter fruit character, even in a Brett beer, the further I get down the road and then add the fruit, the better off I'm going to be. Um, you definitely run into more risks if you let fermentation tail off of getting a stalled fermentation and end up with with a beer that doesn't finish out um but you know that's that's a, a part again part of just like you learning how to work with your with your yeast which is another ingredient you really got to understand and uh you know for me we work with the same yeast day in and day out uh our brett is like part of the family 
Um, we know how it works. We run it up to like 40 plus generations. Um, so it, it very much like it, it just, it's, you know, it's a living organism and we treat it that way and, and we respect it and it tends to do pretty well for us. So I think, you know, again, I, I get a lot of benefits of doing this. You know, we produce 75 barrels of, of Brett beer and mixed culture sour beer and whatever a week. So, I mean, that's a lot more brewing than most home brewers could do <laughs> as far as like trying to, trying to figure out the nuances of like how your yeast works or how fruit works. So uh, I think again, it's just, it's just depending on the fruit and how you want to treat it. But I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer when it comes to like where to add the, the fruit to a beer. Okay. What about temps, uh, temperatures where we're keeping, uh, this free fermentation at, is it, uh, you know, warmer than our typical, you know, 68 to 72 fermentation or is it in that range? Do you guys have any thought on that? I, I so we, know some people yeah, like we, free rise. We, totally. We don't temperature control Brett primary fermentation at all. Um, we actually don't even, the new brewery, I, I, we haven't used our jackets on our fermenters in so long. I don't even have jackets. I have single wall fermenters for the new sour house for Brett primary. I think that only works because we're doing all Brett primary. You know, if I added lacto or, or, or PDO in there, uh, I would definitely want to control the, the temperature because you'd end up with just this like massive uh, bacterial bloom and, and pH drop. So, um, you know, for our process and our Bretts, that works. Uh, I think overall, you know, making sh like holding fermentation temperatures down will help. Uh, but again, you know, when I was talking about those fruit phenolics and stuff, I think at the higher temps, that's where like you see that stuff. So, Again, it, it depends on what Brett you're working with and like what you're trying to achieve and, and all those things. But as far as how we produce beer, um, we don't temperature control. I don't temperature control during uh, fruit refermentations either. So if I'm blending yeah. back on the fruit. Now, the difference there is the beer that's blended on the fruit is the same temperature as our wood cellar, which mm -hmm. is 65 degrees. So the beer is starting at 65 degrees. So those, we don't really see big spikes in temperature. But in our open primary fermentation uh, for just Britannomyces only, and again, we're never using fruit in that primary fermentation. That's usually just a, a wort only fermentation. Uh, those beers are getting up into like, dude, 90, like way up there, man. <laughs> fermentation, we knock out at like 80. So I mean, we're just, we go in hot, Brett likes it, and we just let it rip. Yeah, well, I mean, so you keep mentioning, you know, there's, there's an obvious difference when somebody is souring a beer that's, uh, you know, primary or influenced by maybe a USO5 or a Saccharomyces mm -hmm. strain versus a Brett strain. You're getting a lot more kind of little subtle complexities. You're getting some of that uh, kind of like that barnyard, that dryness, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that kind of, um, you know, you're getting a lot more funk with bread, obviously, yeah. um, which you can really appreciate. And a beer like this, you know, you've got that underlying, the fruit's so beautiful over it. Um, and so it's interesting to see, to see that you're letting that rise up in the 90s, really stressing that bread out to get the real kind of crazy funk and, and all those crazy flavors that Brett likes, likes to create in those high temperatures when it's stressed, mm -hmm. and then kind of calming it down and making it more subtle with the blending and the fruit, right? That's, is that kind of the thought yeah, process? Yeah, blending, blending fruit in time. You know, I think, I think Brett will always work itself down. I mean, we, we tend to see these beers be, you know, maybe a little phenolic going into oak or going into aging, but, you know, two, three months in, um, those, are, uh, those are converted to, I think, more uh, flavor-positive esters um, that I think really positively affect the beer. So, uh, again, you know, for, we're, we're just like um, – we're, we're more art than science in this brewery. You know, like I, we, we create a relationship with a yeast and a process that we understand uh, and keep working towards that and trying until we get the results we want. And then after that, it's really more about like doing a lot of different things and working with a lot of different ingredients and uh, looking at beer in that way. And so for us, it's more about like forging these consistent relationships with a specific organism that's going to help us do what we need to do. Whereas I think you got other breweries like, you know, Jay over the rare barrel, who's, who's, you know, he's doing everything under the sun and you know, those guys are brilliant and they're making obviously award-winning world-class beer. And uh, it's always inspiring for me to go there. And I think it's, it's funny. They like, they approach beer in the complete opposite of us. Whereas like everything I'm changing is like barrel technique and ingredients and whatever. And everything they're changing is the same. It's always the same three beers. They're just changing all of the right. microorganisms they're working with every time. So right. I, mean, I think there's a lot of ways to approach producing sour beer. And this is just the one that seems to, to fit us. And I also think it's giving us like, you know, we, just, we want our beer to taste like wicked weed beer. We want it to, to reflect the palate we have. And I think that's where the blending thing comes in is that, you know, these beers sure. tend to be a little softer and maybe less acetic and um, more Brett forward. And that's, that's really what we're trying to produce. So we just kind of, 
you know, just point the ship down that road and make sure that that's where we're always at. Yeah, I was going to ask you that next because you know, you talk about breweries like <laughs> the one I, the one that I always bring up is Jester King, and you try yeah. Jester King beer, you know it's Jester King. I mean, you know Jester King's in there. Uh, mm-hmm. The aroma's got that Jester King smell. I mean, Wicked Weed's the same way. When I pop one of your sour beers, I know it's Wicked Weed. I, you can you can put me in any blind test, and I guarantee I'm going to pick it out. There's this, <laughs> there's this it makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's this character to it. Um, which is probably why I love you guys so much and Jester King as well, because I, I can just, I love that I know that when I grab one of your guys' beers, these characteristics that I love about it are going to be in there. Um, it's, I, I know that, I mean, I know what to expect right when I pop Marina, but I know that I can expect X, Y, and Z. And I, and I love that and I appreciate that. Um, and so the question is, you know, fruit adds a whole other variable to that. It's not like we're brewing a blonde ale with the same exact yeast culture, same exact bacteria, and it's, and it's you know, the same exact temperature, and it's, everything's completely consistent. When we're adding fruit in, things can change, right? And so for somebody who's brewing at home and wants to recreate a beer, um, but still be able to say, this is my beer, and I'm trying to create a beer that my beers yeah. taste like, uh, what are the kind of pointers you can give them when they're adding fruit to that beer? Well, I think, I think, you know, I mean, I'm wearing like a Jester King shirt right now. So obviously if you're <laughs> yeah, about their beer, like, uh, yeah, Jeff and those guys are good friends of mine. And I think, uh, the beers they make, yeah, I mean, they inspire me and, and are very much the kind of beers I think we strive to make with balance and, and house character. And yeah, I think if you want your beer to taste like your beer every time, I think it's important. Um, yeah, I would say there's a lot of breweries that can that execute that doing different things. You know, I, I mentioned Rare Barrel a second ago. I do find Jay's, uh, Jay and Alex's beers to be very much Rare Barrel beers whenever I have them. So I think there's something to be said that like you can achieve that house character just through blending and through like your process in a lot of ways. But, uh, you know, for me, it's about that consistent yeast profile, consistent process and how we're producing these beers. Uh, again, you know, our mother culture cassette, that's, that's like what makes Wicked Weeds flavor profile what it is that and our, our Brett primary and so for me what you're saying is exactly that's like everything I wanted I wanted people to pick up my beer and go oh that's a wicked weed beer that tastes like a wicked weed beer it tastes like their house flavor it's always consistent it's always what I expected uh with we'll still be able to like surprise them and have different things because I have all these different ways of like painting on that canvas right um and so you know I think as a home brewer um it's about creating a consistent process, uh, whether that's working with different microorganisms organisms or, or working with the same ones. Um, if you want to have a house flavor, I think the best thing you can do is, I mean, I'm a big fan of like, these are wild beers. They're meant to be wild. Like buy into it. Like keep your yeast going, keep your breaths going, keep your culture going, repitch it, let it develop, let it create uh, a symbiotic relationship with everything else around it and, and that works for you so you can make beers that taste like what you envision them to taste like, or at least what you're pushing them towards. Uh, I think every time you go back to a lab and get a fresh pitch, you're starting back at square one as far as uniqueness and house character. So, um, you know, those would be my two tips as a home brewer is like, if you want to start making sour beer, well, commit some time and space to it. And like, doesn't mean you have to brew a beer a week. It just means that like, keep what you're doing alive, be aware of it. Uh, and that means a little bit more dedication to like storing your yeast as you finish and, and keeping uh, keeping all the microbes alive, but you know, that's, that's shit's tough, dude. Like you just put in a, put in an Earl Mahler flask, throw a thing on it, feed it every once in a while. You know, like it's amazing what this stuff can do if you just take yeah. care of it. Um, so yeah, that was okay. So you answered question number two to that, but, uh, so I guess what I'm hearing is, I guess what I'm hearing is for fruited beers to, to maintain that consistency. It's really about the palate and the blending process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I think for fruited beers, maintaining the consistency and flavor is, uh, you know, your house culture is going to play a role in creating a base that's workable. But again, uh, these beers are what you guys drink is a direct exp- expression of like what my palate likes and what my team of um, wood cellar men and how they feel about the beer. You know, we kind of, I don't know if it's because I've just driven it into them like a, you know, <laughs> just beat it into them. This is what the beers are going to taste like. This is what I want. <laughs> But I feel like we all see it the same way. We all we all want the same thing. We all taste the same beer and envision the same beers in the end. Um, and I think that you know I don't know if the Kool Aid's strong or what, but I mean it's it's for us when we go to blend, we're we're pretty consistent in like all seeing the same vision and 
Sure. Uh, you know, I think that's the biggest thing we're doing is like, you know, this was a really great experience. I just, I'm in the middle of a project with Rare Barrel right now. And it was really interesting to go to Rare Barrel and get to go into their cellar for beers that I think taste very different than my beer, although really beautiful, just very different. You know, we have a very different, I'm very Brett Ford, they're very acid Ford, whatever. Sure. But they let me go in and like taste through a bunch of barrels and then blend a beer. The beer I blended tasted like a Wicked Weed beer. You know? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And, and they were part of the blend, but they really let me lead it and guide it. And I, I would say you'd taste it. You may, you, there's nuance to it. It's slightly different. But overall, it's much closer to a Wicked Weed beer than it is a, a Rare Barrel beer. Yeah. Um, and I think that comes to, you know, again, that's my palate. That's what I wanted. That's what, what my palate tells me I want. So that's what I lean towards in blending. So I think there's a lot to be said for these beers and the consistency really coming from the blender and the profile of the blend and how they're approaching it. And, uh, you know, they're going to be coming out to see me soon and we're going to blend a beer at my place. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm going to let them lead. And I'm really excited to see uh, what they end yeah. up doing. You know, do I, make, do I end up making a rare barrel beer over here? So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting. Cool. Um, so that's a really interesting yeah, – and so the importance of blending. So that's something that people need to – I think it's Michael Ton yeah, Michael Tonsmeyer, uh, yep. Matt Fermentation. He talks about it all the time. You know, he's like, if you want to start brewing sour beer, just get stuff in carboys, let it go, and that way you have a canvas to kind of paint on. Mm -hmm. when you have different things to draw from. So, um, with regard to fruit again, so we, we, you do some fruit fermentation in stainless. You were saying mm -hmm. uh, some in oak. If people are are so fruit fermentation in oak. Um, is there kind of how, how do you guys care for the oak once it's in there? How do you guys care for the beer once it's in oak? Is there a certain um, is there a certain process you follow again, or is it just a feel thing? Well, so we don't do much uh, refermentation of uh, fruit in oak. Um, okay, it was something I did early on out of lack of space, but I don't like messes. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we move quickly to like steel and using totes and stuff like that for fruit refermentation because they're easier to deal with and clean out. Um, now we do a lot of racking, uh, you know, like I said, that kind of fruit mixtured beer, but it's more of like a fruit beer going into the barrel opposed to like actually like taking a beer, dumping a bunch of fruit in and letting it go through refermentation. So, you know, I think the challenge with fruiting in barrels is just, it takes a little more cleaning to get the fruit out of the barrel, but you know, a good barrel rinser, um, will, will get you a long way, uh, as far as, uh, you know, just getting some of those organic solids and stuff like that out of there so you can reuse the barrel. So, um, you know, I think it's a great technique and something, especially when you have smaller programs, probably something you're going to need to do because you probably don't have extra tanks laying around for just fruiting things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the big thing is, you know, this is the fun thing about sour beer. There's no real right or wrong answer for any of this stuff. I mean, right. shit, leave the, leave the, you know, pull the beer out, leave the dregs and the fruit in there, rack another beer on, see what happens. Like, if that's what you want. Now, we don't want that. And the real reason I don't want it is because I want to be predictable. I want to be consistent. I want to have control of my process. And so for us, you know, every barrel gets super cleaned and, um, you know, we're making sure that even though we're not even fruiting and reforming those barrels, we're still trying to make sure they're, they're really well rinsed before we fill them. So we're going as best we can. You know, we approach it like, making an IPA or a lager or something, you know, I want to have as many controlled variables in the process as possible. So the uncontrolled variables are mitigated, you know, and I think that's the way we approach it. Uh, but that said, as a, again, as a home brewer, I mean, do whatever you want, man, play with it. Like you, you may love a beer that you, it's your third refermentation on those blackberries that are in there. And that third one was the one that you really loved. I mean, who, who knows, you know, there's nothing, there's no right or wrong answer on how to use these things. I think, I think, uh, something's going to happen. And it's probably going to be flavor positive in some way. Yeah. What about, I guess, so being so control oriented, I guess some of the controls that you're looking at, uh, clean the barrels. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, is there a kind of like a checklist, a checklist you should go through if, you, if you're trying to recreate a beer over and over and over and over and over again, uh, given the somewhat unpredictable nature of a barrel, so given the somewhat unpredictable nature of fruit, somewhat unpredictable nature of bread, uh, you know, time cures all, blending may cure all, but is there a checklist that you kind of go through in your mind at least that says, I need to have these things done to give myself the best odds when I'm throwing fruit into a beer so that Genesis tastes like Genesis, Black Angel tastes like Black Angel, Marina yeah. tastes like Marina. Yeah, I think, I, think I, I mean, we just approach it just like we would if we were making an IPA, you know? I mean, you're making a, an IPA, you're going to be paying attention to all the details, right? You're going to be paying attention to your, your water chemistry, you're going to be paying attention to your oxygenation rates, you're going to be paying attention to you know, how your tanks are being cleaned, fermentation profiles, when the dry hop goes in, you know, all those variables. 
we kind of look at it the same way. You know, I just want to keep as many static variables. I want to be using Brett that's in a similar like generational development as the Brett we used last time. I want to be uh, making sure that I'm going into all clean vessels. I want to make sure that fruiting is happening at the appropriate time that it did last time. Hopefully, working with some real similar quality fruit. Um, you know, I think all those things play a role. And again, like the more of those variables we control, uh, the tighter our window of, of executing something consistent is. And then, sure. yeah, and then at the end of the day, blending kind of clears all. So I just think it's one of those things. We're just, we just, we make beer. You know, we use a lot of CO2 in the sour program. We, you know, again, we treat these beers just like it was any other beer we've ever made. Um, they don't, they don't get some kind of lax, rustic treatment as we go through the brewing process. It's like, we're going to treat it the same way we treat it if I was making pernicious, you know? Yeah, that's great. Cause, I mean, again, you pick up a bottle of the, the beer and you know what you're getting, which is, which is fantastic. I mean, I love it. And so, well, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, and I guess going back a little bit, maybe I'm, I, I'm way out of turn, like way out of order, but I, I thought of questions I should have asked in the beginning. When we're, when we're making our recipes for the actual, um, you know, actual grist, what are we looking at? We know we're going to add fruit to this beer. Are there certain considerations we should make, people should make, breweries should make, home brewers should make when they are cons when they are designing the recipe for the for the base beer itself? Um, yeah. what, what are some of those considerations? What are the considerations that go through your head? And then also with mash temperatures, is there something that you think about when you know you're going to be adding fruit into a beer? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's more so like, you know, what, what role do I want the fruit to play in the beer and what is it accentuating about the, the beer? And so, uh, you know, if, if I'm a good example would be like, you know, we make a beer called recurrent, which is a black currant sour. Um, you know, to me, that beer is a very wine like beer. Uh, oh, I'm always is. trying to work with uh, fresh, fresh empty wine barrels. I want, I want oak tannin. I want to carry some of that wine character over and I want to enhance that, um, with my grist. And so, you know, I'm working with kind of like a lighter, you know, amber grist, trying to kind of build in some of the um, working with like Cararoma um, and trying to build in a little bit of that like kind of fig toffee character to the malt, but without it being like overpowering like a like a Flanders style red where it can get like super raisiny and dainty. Sure. Um, so I mean, I think I think making choices where like I'm trying to build this background to like enhance that that wine like character. Whereas like you look at a beer like Genesis. I mean, dude, I want everything out of the way. I just want it to be like oaty, weedy, bright, lactic you know, promoting the acidity and like really kind of like staying out of the way of the tropical fruits so they can shine. So I think it really just depends on what the vision for the beer is and then really thinking about what does that, what are you trying to achieve with that fruit character? I mean, if you're just trying to make a beer that tastes like that fruit, well, get everything out of the way, let the fruit do its thing. But if you're trying to create a beer that's more nuanced and maybe is this blend of, of barrel and malt and fruit and hops and whatever, uh, again, you know, that just, that's just, uh, you know, this is like, it's, your brewer is kind of like being a chef, man. I mean, you're just you're just taking all the ingredients you have and trying to produce a dish that you're proud of that kind of exhibits what you were feeling in that moment. And so, you know, when producing these kind of beers, we, we kind of look at it the same way. It's just how do I layer these flavors? How do I get that? How do I get that end experience that you have when you open the bottle to be what I envision? You know, sure. and I think that's that's really where we're kind of working back from. So, what about given the fact that we're going to be primary fermenting on bread and then we're going to be re-fermenting on fruit? Is there considerations you give to mash temps? Is there... Yeah, yeah. Um, so we tend to mash in a... We played with high mash temps, low mash temps, whatever. Uh, have not really seen that have much of an impact mm -hmm. with our yeast. I think because our bread's so vigorous, it doesn't really tend to change the way the beer goes in the barrel. We don't see much of a, a terminal gravity uh, change before going into oak. So uh, for us, we kind of stick like, uh, you know, 152, pretty standard mash temp for most of these beers. Uh, now I said, you know, we're doing, you know, spontaneous now, so we've been doing turbid mash and all that fun stuff. But uh, as far as most of the sour beers we produce are, are kind of a standard ale mash temp or, or like what we consider like an IPA mash temp. Um, so, you know, that's the way we look at it. Now we do play with our salt additions a good bit, um, kind of pushing, pushing uh, minerality in the beers. Uh, I do think that plays a really nice mouthfeel character, again, being inspired by breweries I like, Jester King being one of them, and then being like making like some of the most minerally beer out there. Also, another one is uh, Santiago Darius. Um, mm -hmm. Tim's beers over there are like super awesome. Um, and uh, those are those have a lot of minerality to them too. So that plays a, a nice kind of mouthfeel. And, uh, you know, again, going back to talking about chefs, uh, you know, salt's a very important ingredient in a dish and, and using it properly to like enhance flavor is, is really 
beneficial. So, you know, I think we play with a lot of those variables, you know, hopping rates is another one to control acidity and give kind of long-term balance to the beer. Uh, I think those are all like decisions you have to make and, and kind of those things you really just got to like start messing around with them to kind of figure out what works for you and, and whatever your, your brewing setup is. Cool. I, I, we've talked about it a lot. I don't know. <laughs> I should have been. Writing I don't know if we learned more. anything, but we talked about all. <laughs> no, I should have been writing more notes then about what points we hit. But is there anything <laughs> off the top of your head that I've missed that is important, important, important in your process when talking about fruit fermentation? Is there is there anything that is, sticks out as like your number one, two, and three um, consideration? That, you know, what's beautiful about these kinds of beers and for people that brew these beers and brewers that brew these beers is that it allows you to have again, a blank canvas, yep. whereas your brother over there brewing the IPAs is like, shit, I'm off, you know, half a point on my yeah. gravity. I'm off, you know. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and so, like, he's got this, like, you know, really kind of scientific, almost, like, hospital-like. Well, it's like baking. You know, it's like baking versus cooking, you know. Right, right. And so, you know, we've gone over a lot of, like, different small considerations of what, you know, step to step to step from fruit to throwing into a barrel, picking your fruit and throwing it into a barrel. But is there anything that kind of sticks out in your mind is, like, over the last three and a half years, I've learned that when I'm going to be re-fermenting with fruit, I need to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, I mean, I think the I, – I think, you know, less so I feel like I've covered kind of all the X, Ys, and Zs of, of how to use these things and, and how you deal with fruit and and again there's no right or wrong answer i mean you could you know try whatever makes sense to you i mean that's all i've done is i've just done what made sense to me um and i think that it's yielded results that i like so i kept doing it um i think the biggest thing is like if you want your beard to have fruit character um don't be scared to go at it use a lot of fruit especially as a homebrew it doesn't cost you much to use a lot of fruit i think that's one of the mistakes people make they Look at some of these beers that you know breweries like Jester King produce or we produce or whoever pr producing these big fruit forward beers, and they're kind of like, oh man, how did you do that? Well, you know, I put a lot of fruit in it. <laughs> like that's the only way you can get it to taste like that. It's the same way, like how do you get a, a really good IPA to have the aromatics you want? It's like, well, you you can't go at it with a half a pound per barrel and expect it to be some great IPA. Like you need to go after it. So you know, I, I just think with these beers, they take a lot of time and energy. Don't hold back. Go go for it and uh, and just be patient. You know, especially when you get in the bottle. Be my other little suggestion as a home brewer or anybody else producing these beers, just recognize bottle refermentation is a whole other piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're forced carving, bottle conditioning, whatever, um, you know, those beers uh, will, I have tasted so many beers from home brewers specifically who will bring me this like sour beer that I have. And I'm like, wow, this is beautiful. But then it's got some, you know, THP or diacetyl or some like small, subtle right. off flavor. It's totally going to work itself out in the bottle. They just couldn't wait to drink it, you know? So I would just say be patient. Be patient with the barrels. Be patient with your bottles. Be patient with the packaging. Uh, be patient with the, the re-fermentation process. And just know that this is a, this is a game of patience mm -hmm. producing these beers. And, and don't be afraid to wait because 90 – I mean, a great example is this. I have a beer in bottles, which I can't talk about what it is or else I feel like my sales team would kill me. Um, but I have a beer in bottles that I, I put in uh, last winter – uh, that tasted beautiful. It was the most like grapey, gorgeous blonde sour. Um, and I put it in bottles to release it last winter. And after sitting in the bottle for like a week and a half, dude, like the most ethyl acetate nail polish fucking craziness that I've ever <laughs> tasted. I was just like, Oh my God, what are we going to do? And I was like, well, I don't have time to open all these and I just want to see what happens. I don't, I've never known what's going to happen with ethyl acetate long-term in, in a bottle with Brett. What can Brett do with it? You know? Um, so we just set it aside in the cellar and it's been sitting aside for eight months now and <laughs> it's completely gone away and is gorgeous and it's just a beautiful, yeah. beautiful beer. It took six, eight months for it to happen. So yeah. I, I, think, I think a good example of that is, and, and now, you know, I have 30 barrels of a really beautiful beer that I'm going to be able to sell instead of dumping down the drain, which is, sure. you know, makes the other yeah, that's, very happy. So. that's incredibly important. And we could talk for hours about yeah, yeah, totally. conditioning. I mean, re-fermentation in the bottle. That's a whole <laughs> <Damn another. laughs> Oh my God. That's a whole nother subject. Yeah. But that's a really good point. Cause that's happened to me a bunch at home. You know, I a bottle, it tastes like gorgeous. And then three weeks on the line, I open another bottle. It's like, Oh shit, this is completely undrinkable. And then five months later, the beer is like, boom, that's what I wanted. Right. And so that's totally, yeah, there's a reason the uh, the lambic producers lay their lambic down for usually like six to nine months before anybody tastes it. You know, 
I think if we all had that patience as brewers, uh, the consistency of these sour beers going into the market would be much higher. And you know, something we're really working towards. You know, we try to hold everything two months, and uh, you know, two months tends to be a very good holding pattern for us with the consistency of the product we produce. We're really usually very sure uh, of what's going to market. We we hadn't you know until just recently we hadn't never really had an issue with it. Um, so, you know, I think, I think trying to create that patience and recognize that that's part of your process is it like, mm. just take your time. One last question. Got you, dude. One last question. And it's a, uh, <laughs> maybe a long answer, but we, okay. So just like, like, <laughs> all right. So re-fermentation in a bottle, when you've added fruit to a beer, you've added more sugar to the beer. What is there a different process when putting a fruited beer into a bottle free fermentation? Uh, we don't treat it differently, but we look at the uh, terminal gravity as, as our kind of guiding, you know, gravity's gravity, residual sugar's residual sugar. I think that's the one variable you need to be aware of and, and understand, you know, depending on where the pH is and like where your beer sits as far as re-fermentation and like whatever yeast you're working with, like how far down that's gonna take it and then be able to calculate that into your bottling sugar addition or whatever to kind of determine what's your your end uh, CO2 volumes is going to be, you know, it's the, 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 the yeah, the fucking <laughs> mystery of the century is bottle conditioning yeah. sour. Like that's, that's, that's for another the day. Hardest, <laughs> the hardest thing you have to do, man. It sucks. That's, that's for another day. <laughs> that's for another day, dude. Yeah. So, you know, just so, so hard to predict what's going to happen in those bottles. <laughs> I'm going to end this like Howard Stern is, is interviews. Oh, you said a lot. Uh, you said everything. We have talked about it all. <laughs> and uh so you a lot that was good <laughs> I, hey we, we sandwiched a lot into an hour and 15 minutes I'm, so i know i'm pretty impressed i'm pretty happy about it so thank you so much i think it's gonna be really cool um people are gonna get to read with jeff uh jesser king thinks about refermentation but they're also gonna get to hear a lot about what wicked weed does in their process and creates these really beautiful beers um and that was largely because I actually don't know how to write. So <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this was the only way to get the information out of my head. <laughs> yeah. So one of my friends today sent me a text message, like a really big word. And I responded like, what does that even mean? And so he, he writes me back. He goes, oh, you know what it means. I go, yeah, but the thing is I, I like, I write like a five-year-old. So, you know, there's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyways. So awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time. I, I really, you know, I'm, People who listen to me must think I'm kissing people's asses when I when I do this, but I really love Wicked Weeds beers. They're, they've been a big inspiration to me when I brew. Um, uh, potential future thoughts for me, and, and Wicked Weeds a big part of that for me, and and, and Craft Commander in general. Um, and so thank thank you so much for taking the time to talk about your process. I know that a bunch of people are going to really appreciate it. I know I do, and um, you guys are one of the top in my opinion, in the country right now with these fruit fermented beers and fruit beer, and just fruit beers in general, and your hoppy beers too, which we didn't talk about today. But the hoppy beers are just off, they're, they're, they're crazy good. So um, for, for people who haven't been out to Asheville, make sure you stop by Wicked Weed if you do. Um, both locations, uh, you're going to get a different experience at each. And um, Thanks. Yeah, man. Uh, thank, thank you so much for having us on, man. Uh, yeah, Luke and I are, are big fans of what you guys are doing. So any, anytime, reach out. Cheers. All right. Appreciate it.